Okay, uh, I'm just going to welcome everyone back here. Hopefully, you've all had a beverage, taking care of business, and uh, we're all set for our second half, which should be just as engaging. Uh, so, just as a reminder, we have two lectures to go and a QA to follow. Uh, our next speaker will be Dr. Annie Trevers, and um, the final speaker of the day will be Dr. Tim Cook. So, we look forward to the rest of the program. I appreciate all of your participation and uh, for joining us again this afternoon. So it's my pleasure this afternoon to introduce our next speaker. Uh, so Dr. Annie Traverse graduated with a degree in dental surgery in 1980 from the University of London. He has lived in Canada for 33 years and has worked as a dentist in Burlington. He joined the RCMI in 2008 and became a member of the museum committee in 2015. And he's not just a dentist. His passion for military history led him to complete a master's degree followed by a PhD in history, writing his thesis on the Anglo-Zulu War in 1879. And he has published numerous articles on a variety of military subjects, which include various topics, such as the relationship between dental health and the ability to wage war, military medicine and medical services in the 19th century, including combat stress during the Zulu War. His most recent article focuses on the identification and the authentication of Zulu close combat spheres from the 19th century. And he possesses perhaps one of the greatest private military history collections in Canada. And personally, he provided me with a bursary to attend the Centennial in Vimy Ridge, France in 2017, for which I will always be grateful. And you've traversed, my friend, I pass it on to you. Yes, thank you, Ryan. So today I shall be talking about the medical services and military medicine in the British Army during the Anglo-Zulu War of 1879. So the um, medical services and military medicine in 1879 really hadn't changed since the Crimean War, but I'll be talking about that in a moment. The area of operations concerning the Anglo-Zulu War took place in South or Southern Africa in a small area on the right, on the East Coast, known as Zululand surrounded by Boer Republics and the various British colonies that eventually made up South Africa. Despite the lessons learned from the Crimean War of 1854 to 1856, little real progress had been made in the provision of uh, military and medical services by 1879. While the intention was there after the Crimean War, to improve uh, military medicine and the delivery of medical services to avoid the disaster that occurred during that conflict, little had changed because of all the dogmatic thinking in the establishment. The, the British Medic Army Medical Services comprised of the Army Medical Department and the Army Hospital Corps. The Army Medical uh, Department um, consisted of officers and they were all surgeons or um, medic, medical officers, all possessing a medical degree. The Army Hospital Corps provided the supporting services and were, um, sorry, let's do this, okay. And provided the attendants, the hospital personnel, the orderlies and the administrators for hospitals. The problem with recruiting of soldiers during the Anglo-Zulu War was a dire problem in the 1870s. Interest was declining. People didn't want to serve in the British Army. The conditions and the pay was not very enticing. And although 30% of applicants were deemed unfit and rejected for service, they had already lowered the standards. The um, average applicant was not a good healthy specimen coming from the working poor class that comprised 90% of British society. Of those that um, were recruited, they were put through pretty um, uh, arduous 
and intensive training uh, to fit them up. And they were fed fairly well to help them because the uh, British government and the military authorities realized that as the working poor, they didn't enjoy very healthy diets. In the 1870s, theories regarding causes of disease um, was mired in dogmatic thinking. There were two comp competing theories with regards to the causes of disease. There was the miasmatic theory and the zymotic theory. In the miasmatic theory, um, the presence of miasma or bad air or mal air, as it was called, was the cause of all disease. And those the supporters of the zymotic theory felt that everybody had this layer of uh, cuticle or an extra uh, layer of skin that was invisible called um, uh, that zyme. And zyme itself was the cause of disease because if the balance of the zyme presence on the body was changed, then it would invade the body and affect certain organs and cause disease. On campaign in South Africa, the average British soldier ran the risk of contracting a whole host of diseases. He ran the risk of contracting enteric or typhoid fever, cholera, dysentery, malaria, syphilis, rheumatism, respiratory, ophthalmic, urinary, urinary tract and liver diseases. Heat stroke was common, and the average soldier had to contend with invasive parasites such as tapeworm, which was very common. You also had to contend with being afflicted with lice, and ran the risk of insect and snake bites, being attacked by ticks and flies such as mosquitoes. In 1876, the British Army finally came up with a plan regarding the medical arrangements of a British Army Corps a uh, strength of 36,000 man, men with regards to the arrangements in the field for the medical services. Simply, simply put, there were to be um, aid stations at the front, mobile field stations behind the front, further down the line, fixed field stations, and then a whole host of base stations all leading back through the lines of communication to the base of operations, usually by the coast, so that the um, invalids and or sick soldiers and wounded soldiers could be transported back to England on the hospital ships. In England, there were three main military hospitals based at Woolwich, Portsmouth, and Netley. There were seven stages with regarding the treatment of the severely wounded soldier. First, he would fall in battle and be wounded, dressed, and he would be dressed by the battalion attendants or medical officers. Then he would be, would be transported to the dressing station by stretcher bearers. Now in 17, 1876, it was planned to have uh, a company or a, a series of companies of stretcher bearers, but that didn't quite come to fruition until 1879. And at the end of the anglo Zulu war. Anyway, stretcher bearers were used to transport the um, wounded to the uh, uh, dressing station, and from there to the mobile field hospital, and then to the stationary field hospital. From there, the wounded would be sent by convoy to the base hospitals, and then transferred to the hospital ships. As far as preparation for, the, for war in South Africa in 1879, the British Army appointed Surgeon General Sir John Wolfries, a very competent um, administrator and uh, organizer. In fact, despite the problems that he had to face, he did a very good job and was not criticized for what ensued during the following six months once the campaign began. Unfortunately, he was uh, plagued with lack of resources, resu Personal res personnel resources and supplies. The medical officers he had on hand that were supplied by the Army Medical Department totaled 20. 14 were active surgeons and six were administrators. 
The British government sent another 23 civilian surgeons to South Africa and the Naval Medical Department supplied two. So in total, there were 45 medical officers, medically trained, of course, to provide services to the British uh, soldiers. And the ratio was one medical officer to 366 uh, enlisted men in the British Army. And this was not a good ratio, it would cause problems later and uh, would uh, expose the deficiencies of the, organized, the organization with regards to the conflict in South Africa in 1879. The Army Medical Department was supported by the Army Hospital Corps. And in South Africa in 1879, this numbered only 124 personnel. And as I explained earlier, they provided the orderlies, the attendants, and the administrators for the hospitals and 124 stretched across the um, battlefront there or the area of operations was uh, very insufficient. The medical supplies were limited because simply put, Lord Chelmsford, the commander of the British Army, felt that they didn't need more than what they had. So they didn't call them more medical supplies to be sent from Britain because he felt that the campaign would be swift and successful and he, he based these assumptions on his experiences the previous year when the Ninth Cape War ended, where it was very efficiently um, conducted on the part of the British Army. Victory was uh, uh, fairly easy and the medical resources were not prevailed upon as much as they could have been. So as I explained, the um, British Army medical uh, services involved movable and static field hospitals, base hospitals, ambulance services, stretcher bearers, and they used native recruits to act as stretcher bearers. A big problem in South Africa during campaign was hygiene and sanitary conditions. Medical officers were um, appointed as hygiene or sanitary officers to the extent that Surgeons available to carry out surgery on wounded and sick personnel became fewer because surgeons were used to uh, take care of the hygiene and sanitary situation. In January 1879, the British Army invaded Zululand in southern Africa. The invasion force consisted of four columns. Confident that a quick victory would be achieved with minimal effort and cost, Lord Chelmsford based his assumption of success on the experience of the Ninth Cape War that lasted from 1877 to 1878. Unexpectedly, the first invasion was an unmitigated disaster with much loss of life and exposed the inadequacies of Chelmsford's strategy and tactics. The deficient medical services were not prepared for the overwhelming challenges, challenges that resulted from this unexpected outcome. And here we see a toy soldier diorama showing part of the Battle of Visandwana, in which a force of 1,500 men were totally wiped out by a force of 20,000 Zulus. Only 71 Europeans survived and escaped to tell the story. There were many last stands on the battlefield, but every red coat was killed and no, no red coat survived the battle to tell the tale. And here we see an ambulance with a medical attendant from the Army Hospital Corps with the wounded soldier being attacked by Zeus. The disaster resulted in stalemate and required improvisation on the part of the medical services. As I explained, the column was totally wiped out and most of the medical supplies that uh, was held by the column was lost. Everything was lost. When they came back to search for the dead and uh, tried to retrieve supplies, weapons, wagons, etc. Everything was taken. Also, medical staff were killed at Isandwana, thereby reducing 
the number of uh, available medical personnel to provide medical services for the soldiers as everything moved forward in terms of having to deal with the ensuing problems that were experienced by the British Army because of disease. Ensuing stalemate was aggravated by epidemics. Because of the uh, hot, rainy season at that time of year and very poor living conditions, there was very little shelter available on campaign. And so uh, the epidemics took hold and many soldiers became very sick. The first invasion resulted in 801 deaths and only a few wounded soldiers. And those were mostly at Rourke's Drift. The reason for that was because face to face with a Zulu soldier, either the British soldier survived and was able to run away as in the Battle of Isanwana, or he succumbed to his fate and died. A total of 78 deaths resulted from diseases from January to March of 1879. Now this, was, this problem was to become worse, as we shall see. Medical supplies pur were purchased from practitioners in lo from local settlements and towns as far as Cape Town. This was necessary because there was a, a massive shortage of medical supplies owing to the losses of Isolwana. Local civilian medical personnel, including physicians and surgeons, were re recruited in order to uh, provide services to the uh, sick soldiers. Reorganization and recovery. Britain takes note and delivers a dose of medicine. Reinforcements were rushed to South Africa. The uh, British government realized that they couldn't let this disaster in South Africa continue and could not let the Zulu nation go unpunished. The British army was increased from about 12,000 to 22,000. It was reorganized and prepared for the second invasion. Medical services and the network of hospitals improved and kept to that plan that was developed in 1876. Fixed movable field hospitals, base hospitals and convalescent centers were set up. The efficient evacuation of wounded and sick soldiers actually started to improve. Britain sent more surgeons to increase the total of uh, personnel in South Africa to total 124 by June of 1879. And the, the uh, Army Hospital Corps was bolstered by increasing numbers sent to South Africa and a strength increase to 409 in June 1879. Another 76 surgeons were ready to sail to South Africa that month. Press correspondents were numerous in South Africa during the campaign, and they sent many reports back to Britain, Britain which were published in the newspapers. Uh, one such correspondent was Norris Newman, and his uh, reports were eagerly read by the public back home. Because of the losses at Isandwana and the stalemate in South Africa, there was a public outcry, which obviously resulted from uh, the, the hurt of, of, and to the pride of the British nation and the British Empire. So while the British government was galvanized into having to do something, voluntary aid organizations raised funds, sent money, also sent medical and other supplies to South Africa. One particular voluntary aid organization was called the Staffordshire House Committee. And this was in England and it recruited and paid for a contingent of civilian nurses, a total of seven nurses, and they were sent to South Africa. The British Army, namely the um, Army Medical Dep Department got wind of this, and not to be outdone, sent a competing group of military nurses and actually sent more than what the Staffordshire House Committee sent in order to say that they contributed more. Now these nurses played a major role in treating patients towards the latter part of the Anglo-Zulu War in 1879. So while they arrived late, they were very important in treating the, the sick that had succumbed to the epidemics. 
the medical officers in South Africa had to improvise. So while they made maximum use of the meager resources they had early on in the uh, campaign, some used locally found herbs and made remedies and adopted some native practices to make up deficiencies in medicines. One particular uh, surgeon by the name of um, surgeon, uh, fleet surgeon Norbury at Eshawi, where there was a siege for like um, three months. The um, lack of medicines there was made up by him going out, uh, risking his life because the, Luz the Zulus were uh, close by as they were besieging Eshawi and started to pick uh, herbs and made up his own concoctions, which he wrote about in his uh, biography later after the war. The rapid response by the British government and volunteer organization improved the delivery of medical services. It was important to avoid the repeat of the Crimean War experience. And this map shows the new network of medical station, uh, hospitals, base stations, movable hospitals, and the distribution of med other medical facilities during the Anglo-Zulu War. The main base hospital station was at Durban. The other base hospitals were at uh, Newcastle, Ladysmith, and Pierce Maritzburg. And between them and the front were other stationary hospitals, and uh, at the front, the movable hosp hospitals um, moves with the front line deep into Zululand. Statistics. During the Anglo-Zulu War of 1879, 12,900 British regular soldiers served during that campaign. There were approximately 12,000 hospital admissions and outpatient care cases due to disease. Approximately 850 British troops were killed in action. Approximately 200 British troops were wounded in action. The ratio of killed to wounded in action was disproportional um, given that under normal campaign conditions and actions, it used would be more like 850 British troops wounded to every 200 British troops killed in action. Approximately 300 British troops died during the campaign of disease. Approximately 1,200 British troops were sent back to Britain as a result of disease or combat wounds. 218 of those 1,200 troops that were sent back to Britain were invalided from the army due to disease and 50 were discharged on account of their wounds. These statistics do not account for the irregular or colonial volunteers and native soldiers that numbered approximately 7,000. While they served during the Anglo-Zulu War, there weren't the statistics put together that were uh, done for the Imperial troops. The progress that resulted from the Anglo-Zulu War, and this is pretty interesting. George Stoker, Dr. George Stoker, was a civilian surgeon that saw service during the um, Russo-Turkish War 1877 to 1878. As far as his colleagues were concerned, he was fairly lazy, if not bone idle as a, a doctor or a surgeon, and um, really didn't impress his peers very well. But during the anglo War, he was taking care of one of the base hospitals and while he was responsible for the um, uh, treatment and care of the British soldiers that were wounded or were sick, the British Army took care of Zulu wounded. And the care provided or offered to the Zulu wounded was fairly good. And there was no problem on the part of the British authorities. They wanted to show that there was goodwill being applied moving forward because at some stage the war would end and peace would have to be declared and uh, kept between the Zulu and Zulus and the British. Now, Dr. George Stoker noticed that 
Zulus that refused British medical contemporary treatment would take care of their own. They would move up to the highest point in the area in the morning of a sunny day, often helped by other Zulus or natives, and under the bright sunshine at the top of these hills, they would uh, expose their wounds to the sun and their native helpers would constantly clean the wounds. The Zulus would come down at night and sleep in the hospitals and then the next morning they would be carried up or would make their own way up to the top of these same hills and once again exposing themselves to the sun, the wounds that is, that, and um, having their helpers or friends constantly clean the wounds. Dr. Stoker theorized that there must be more concentrated oxygen the higher you go with altitude. He also theorized that the sun must have some effect on the healing of wounds. And he correctly theorized that there was a connection between oxygen and healing of wounds. So with these theories, he went back to England after he left the British Army and he put these into practice and for, opened up in 1894, the London um, Oxygen Hospital. And it became a very famous hospital and he put into practice uh, therapies or techniques using oxygen and ozone. Ozone had been discovered in the 1840s. The application of oxygen and ozone for the treatment of skin wounds became very successful. It became so successful that he wrote numerous papers in the British Medical uh, Journal called The Lancet. And prior to World War I, the London Oxygen Hospital became an important uh, place for the treatment of skin wounds such as ulcers. And in those days where health was not uh, the greatest compared to uh, today, as far as the population is concerned, there were many, many skin afflictions, in particular ulcers and wounds that didn't heal. So Stoker applied oxygen and ozone to these wounds, and that eventually led to the development of, development of hyperbaric oxygen treatment. This is essential for the treatment of various diseases, including cancer, and is very commonly used today. So the hyperbaric oxygen treatment can say it has its roots in George Stoker's theories that were put into practice. And of interest, Dr. George Stoker was a brother of a very famous author by the name of Bram Stoker. And we all know that Bram Stoker wrote the novel Dracula. Sanitation, furthermore, um, sanitation and hygiene in the field improved as a result of the experiences in South Africa. And it, was, it would only be a couple of years until the evidence of microbes, namely bacteria, and other um, microorganisms other than bacteria would be recognized as being involved in diseases. The, after that, the general health and welfare of the average soldier would improve. At the end of the Anglo-Zulu War, proper stretcher bearer units finally reached Africa and were established there to expedite the clearance from the battlefield of wounded soldiers to improve the chances of recovery. At the same time as the Anglo-Zulu War in South Africa, other conflicts were occurring. So it wasn't just the Zulus the British were fighting, they were fighting in Cape Colony and other parts of Southern Africa uh, against other tribes and stretcher bearer units were used there. They were employed after the battle and they were found to be so successful that um, Wolsey, the commander in South Africa at that time, 
after um, Chelmsford's resignation and recall back to Britain, felt that this was essential in the proper care of wounded and recognized that it would expedite the healing process. During the anglo Sulu War and parallel conflicts in South Africa in 1879, two Victoria Crosses were awarded to medical officers for valor in the face of the enemy. This ensured that medical officers would finally be given more respect and recognition as frontline personnel facing the same risks in combat as other officers. The problem in the 1870s, as well as having a, a experiencing a decline in recruitment in the British Army for enlisted men, there was um, a declining interest in the Army Medical Corps, given that the conditions and the pay, the recognition and the respect really hadn't changed since the Crimean War. And medical officers did not want to be considered second-rate officers. Following the experiences of the British Army in South Africa in 1879, the military establishment began to seriously consider improvements to the medical services. In other words, something was finally going to be done. This ultimately resulted in the formation of a proper United Medical Corps integrating the Army Medical Department, the Army Hospital Corps and the stretcher bearer companies. In 1898, the Royal Army Medical Corps was established. Never again would the British Army be deficient in qualified personnel, equipment and supplies in the provision of medical services during a military conflict. That, ladies and gentlemen, concludes my lecture and presentation. And I shall hand you back to Ryan. Thank you, Andy, for that fine and interesting presentation. Uh, and especially for stepping in for Caitlin at the 11th hour. Uh, I know that was a lot to ask, but uh, you performed admirably as always. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, now, I'm particularly interested in this topic. Uh, during my time at uh, Queen's years and years ago, I, one of my, my papers was on the Anglo-Zulu War. So it's a personal interest. Uh, cool to have the small Canadian connection uh, to your hometown. And um, we look forward to hearing more at the question and answer period. This leads me to my introduction of our fourth and final speaker of the day. Dr. Tim Cook is a historian at the Canadian War Museum and the director of research there. He's the author of 13 books, including his most recent work, The Fight for History, 75 Years of Forgetting, Remembering, and Remaking Canada's Second World War. Tim, who has collaborated with me at RCMI several times in the past, was recently appointed as the honorary historian of the Institute. He has also curated many permanent, temporary, traveling and digital exhibitions, including Munnings, The War Years. His books have won many awards, including the RBC Taylor Prize. He is director of Canada's Historical Society, a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, and a member of the Order of Canada. Tim, my friend, over to you. Thanks, Ryan. Um, thank you for that lovely introduction. Uh, this will be the moment of truth in trying to uh, share my screen. And I hope that. Can you see that all right? We're good. You can? That's great. Well, um, it's lovely to be back uh, at the RCMI. Um, I wish we could be in person, but um, uh, perhaps uh, next year. And uh, it's a great honor to, to speak to you, I guess for the first time as uh, now the honorary historian. And um, uh, I appreciate very much that, um, that honor. The, uh, the, the previous talk from Andy was fascinating. I, I wrote a book over COVID uh, on war and medicine in the Great War. And um, so I, I was interested to hear of those medical advances in times of war 50 odd years before the Great War. 
And uh, perhaps Ryan, when the book comes out next year in September of 22, I'll have a chance to come and, and speak uh, on the ground at our CMI. So this talk, as Ryan has said, is based on uh, new research. Um, oops, I'm having trouble here. Just give me one second. My PowerPoint is not advancing. Uh, so this is based on new research that was conducted by Jack Granitstein and I um, at the Canadian War Museum for an exhibition on the 100 Days Campaign. And it was called uh, Victory 1918. And uh, there we go, we're going again. And it, it really explored, um, as Ryan has uh, spoken so um, powerfully to today as well, um, the, the Canadians in the 100 Days Campaign, the series of battles from Amiens on the 8th of August, 1918, uh, through to the capture of Mons on the last day of the war. Uh, it was an exhibition that was seen by about 50,000 people, and I think it uh, had an impact in helping to explain and present the importance of Canada's uh, 100 Days campaign and the contributions of the Canadian Corps, especially under command of Sir Arthur Curry. But I'm not going to talk about those battles. Uh, I want to talk about something different. And it is about the liberation of the French uh, during this same time period. So in about 30 minutes, I want to make three points in this talk, all connected to this idea of Canada's war of liberation. The first one is that some Canadians enlisted because they saw this as a necessary war and a war of liberation. I'll talk more about that. Secondly, but there was a critical period of liberation during the Hundred Days that has been largely uh, unexplored by Canadians or any other historians. And during this period, as you will find out, Canadians liberated over 200 cities, towns and villages, giving back freedom to over 70,000 civilians. It's almost entirely absent from our history books. So that's really the focus of what I want to talk about today. The third point, though, is why? Why is it absent from our history books? And I want to explore a little bit uh, and use the example of the liberation story or the absence of it to explore a little bit about the memory of Canada's Great War. As a uh, British dominion in the empire, Canada was at war when Britain went to war on the 4th of August, 1914, but it was Canadians who would decide the extent of their commitment. Now, standing by Britain was the primary factor, the primary factor in drawing Canadians into the ranks. But there were other impulses too, not the least being the outrage over Germany's invasion and occupation of Belgium and France. Stories of hardship and atrocity were amplified by propaganda, but there was a core truth to the fact that Germany from late 1914 was occupying one fifth of Belgium and about 5% of France, including 2 million French citizens in the Northeastern section. Under such conditions with Germany as a great power smashing its neighbors, and occupying the lands of Western allies, it's not surprising that Canadians were motivated to action. Now I'm, I'm emphasizing this point because as we know since the 1960s and perhaps even stretching back further to the early 1930s, there has been a, a strong sense that the soldiers, Canadian soldiers, maybe all soldiers were tricked into serving or were naive and did not understand the full ramifications of their actions. Now, there can be no doubt that few of the 620,000 Canadians who enlisted or the 100,000 or so who were conscription, few of them anticipated the trench warfare experience on the Western Front with all of its carnage and brutality. And yet many Canadians were motivated to serve because they felt it was a just war. And, and I want to build on that. As Canadian politicians and other societal leaders stoked the fires of patriotism, they almost always pointed to the German occupation of Belgium and France. 
both the British and the Canadian people talked of standing up for little Belgium with the Kaiser's contemptuous phrase that the treaty signed in 1839 guaranteeing Belgian neutrality was but a scrap of paper. And you see the poster here before you. In fact, they made a recruitment poster basically uh, um, uh, highlighting Germany's contempt. Now, the British people rebuked the Germans. They spoke of honoring that commitment and Canadians felt the same. The invasion of Belgium and the subsequent atrocity stories, both real and fabricated, also motivated Canadians to action. And there was a whole series of speeches and cartoons. These are two cartoons here from uh, Louis Raymaker, who was a very famous um, a cartoonist, and um, uh, he wrote and or depicted the war always um, uh, with a very heavy hand in terms of German atrocities, but he was actually building upon realities. Um, the burning of the Louvain Library with its uh, destruction of uh, 300,000 irreplaceable books and manuscripts. That was an outrage to um, much of the world, as was the execution of some five thousand partisans and civilians in Belgium, all real. I mean, these are real stories. Uh, they were amplified by more fabricated uh, stories of uh, bayoneting babies and the mass rape of women and girls. And yet there was great outrage. To pick one of many Canadians, uh, Private Dan McClellan of Grand River, Prince Edward Island, which was not a great metropolis, felt obliged to enlist because of the German oppression. And there are many letters like this, but this one, which he wrote to his mother, uh, he, he wrote to her saying he preferred not to go to war. But when a peace loving country is in distress and thousands of its peaceful loving citizens driven from their homes by the unjust hand of Prussianism, could you ever forgive a son for being a traitor to these peace loving people? And there were many other Canadians who felt the same. They, their hearts reached out to brave Belgium or uh, um, to France that was uh, undergoing uh, this titanic war on its soil. And the idea of fighting for freedom should not perhaps surprise us too much. Canadians um, have always fought for a number of reasons, uh, national interest, alliance warfare, but often because many Canadians have felt the need to fight and often to liberate or to fight in a cause. Think of Tyler's uh, wonderful talk we heard a couple of hours ago. What motivated those Canadians? What motivated the Canadians who served in Korea uh, or in the Second World War or in more modern conflicts? Now there isn't one motivation I think there's an overlapping mental map of emotions or drivers that impelled Canadian men to leave their families and communities to go overseas. And I'll just talk about the First World War here, although I think often it applies to other conflicts. And I'll just end this section by talking about one French Canadian soldier, future Governor General of Canada, Georges Vanier, who recounted, I could not read the accounts of Belgian sufferings without a deep compassion and an active desire to right the heinous wrongs done. And he in fact wrote other things about the need to fight uh, and to stand by France as well. Now, I wanna be careful here. I don't wanna overplay my hand. The idea of freeing the oppressed motivated many Canadians, but there was, and this is important to emphasize, a constellation of ideas, including patriotism, adventurism, financial reasons, if uh, issues of masculinity, um, just some of the motivations that drove men to leave their loved ones. And many of those reasons, it is quite clear, were blown away in the trenches. Uh, you can still find evidence of soldiers writing home to their families that they were fighting or motivated to fight to free the oppressed of France or Belgiums, but it appears to be a less dominating factor. Once the soldiers were in the trenches, uh, and then the primary motivation seems to be standing by one's uh, mates in battle or simply seeing the job through to the end because that was the only way to get home. But again, it's clear to me 
and I have spent 25 years studying the First World War. I have read thousands upon thousands of letters and diaries and memoirs and probably every book and, and every article published in Canada and, and many others beyond this, is that these Canadians were not a group of naive men tricked by politicians and propaganda. Many Canadians, and I think this extends to others in the British Empire, served in this war because they believed it was just and necessary. And I think that's a point I would like you to think about. Now, since I've only got about 10 or uh, 15 minutes left, I, I need to jump ahead to the 100 Days Battles. Um, these are the Titanic battles that were a series of costly victories. Uh, more than 42,500 Canadians were killed or wounded uh, in 60 days of battles, in three titanic affairs at MEN, at the Battle of Arras, and finally the capture of Cambrai on the 9th of October, which was the most important aspect of the Canadian Corps series of battles. The capture of Cambrai, uh, that was a major German logistical city. It, it's uh, when the Canadians wrestled it away from the Germans and drove them out, it destabilized the entire German line for hundreds of kilometers in each direction, forcing them into retreat. And this is where I want to pick up the story of liberation. Now, the Canadians were fought out. They were exhausted. 42,500 casualties. They had lost some of their best long service men. Almost all of the infantry battalions were down to half strength. Uh, and we know it was the infantry throughout the war that bore the worst of the casualties. And yet the Canadian Corps continued to lead the pursuit of the broken German army on British First Army Front, which was the army that they were fighting uh, as a part of. So Cambrai is captured on the 9th, there's fighting on the 10th and the 11th, and then the Canadians are ordered to pursue the uh, retreating Germans who are moving in a eastward, northeastward direction towards Mons. And we can see in this map here in the bottom left corner, uh, you see Cambrai about seven or eight kilometers uh, off this map. And you see Mons in the top right corner, which was the ultimate objective, or at least the end of the Canadian assault. Um, and the Canadians begin to, to drive forward, marching two divisions um, on a two division front on a, on a wide arc, from the 14th of October. They really begin to move forward at that point. And so they will eventually advance about 75 kilometers from Cambrai to Mons. Now, it's important to remember that I know when the war ended, as you do on November 11th, and we know where it ended for the Canadians, around or in Mons, and we know it was 75 kilometers, but those soldiers did not know that. Um, of course, we have the gift of hindsight. For them, it was one more day after another, days of marching, days of battle all throughout this period. Not the great set piece battles like Vimy or the Somme or Hill 70 or MEN, but still major engagements, two and three battle battalion engagements. Um, that would be 1,800 to, to 2,000 soldiers fighting in a particular battle. So we're not talking about small firefights here. Nonetheless, the Germans were steadily falling back and the Canadians were driving them back. And if you read the letters and the diaries from this time period, the Canadians begin to realize that this war might end. It was a war, of course, before the Hundred Days that no one thought would end before 1919 and probably 1920. And yet everywhere, as Corps Commander Sir Arthur Curry wrote, the Germans were falling back. Now, to slow the pursuers, the Germans engaged in the scorched earth policy. They destroyed bridges. They created roads. They fouled water sources. They left sacrificial rearguard forces to interrupt the advance. And yet there was no denying the Canadians. And dozens, sometimes hundreds, occasionally thousands of German prisoners were captured every single day of this advance. On the uh, morning of the 18th of October, the Canadians began to encounter more heavily populated French towns. And uh, this is where the liberation phase really begins as dozens of large settlements that day on the 18th uh, and smaller villages were liberated and it continued also on the 19th, uh, which was another day of steady marching and fighting some 12 kilometers, which by the way is the single uh, largest advance and drive of the Canadians uh, on any day during the war. 
and they continued the Canadians to steamroll forward, liberating on the 19th of October another 40 settlements. Now, many of these liberations involved driving the Germans out with shot, shell, and bayonet. And the largest industrial town of Denain, on the north bank of the Canal de Esco, uh, was cleared in heavy fighting. And yet behind the advance, as it steadily moved forward, secondary and tertiary Canadian forces began to encounter the French who emerged from their villages and from the hiding places as the battlefront moved off. And a war diarist for just one of the Canadian battalions wrote on the 19th, and this is in the official diary, coffee, cognac, kisses and hugs were showered on the troops by the populace who were frantic with joy after having suffered four years of slavery under the ruthless rule of Hun masters. The act of freeing the French um, was verbalized uh, by the citizens of Diné and others who sang out in praise, who uh, posted banners that read, uh, Vivre le Canadien, glory to the heroes, long live the liberators. And the Canadians continued that liberation as they move forward. And some of these photographs you see here have been uh, colorized by the Vimy Foundation, but also as part of our exhibition at the Canadian War Museum, we engaged uh, in uh, significant research to ensure that the, the photographs um, uh, were true to historical records as, or material culture as best we could. Another important function, if we build on Ryan's commentary about the importance of the real artifacts, the authentic, and how they continue to reverberate over time. As the Canadians continued to march eastward, the French uh, poured out of the streets in uh, the largest cities and the, to the smallest villages to welcome the Canadians with public celebrations. And we should remember that the fighting up to this point, well, these people had been under occupation from the very start of the war, from August of 1914. So indeed, four uh, years plus of occupation they had faced. And they weren't sure if the Canadians would be driven back, in fact, as had often been the case in back and forth seesaw fighting. But it appeared as the Canadian advance continued that the Canadians would not be driven back. And, and this uh, really becomes a great period of celebration. A Canadian gunner from the 43rd Battery wrote of the liberation during this time, it was probably the greatest moment of the war, he wrote. As we passed down the street, the women, old men, and children yelling themselves hoarse and waving long hidden flags. The greatest moment indeed. Echoing that comment, the regimental historian of the 15th Battalion wrote of the combat hardened Canadian soldiers. It was the first time they had ever really felt like heroes and saviors of democracy. As part of the experience of cheering people waving flags that raised the Canadian soldiers' spirits, they also encountered thousands of refugees returning to their homes. With logistics stretched to the breaking point in the long march pursuing the Germans, um, there was this added strain of having to feed and offer medical care to tens of thousands of suffering French. One Canadian wrote, over 200 civilians are sick. He was just dealing with a small little, excuse me, village. About 15 of them have died in the last three days from consumption, starvation, and ill treatment from the Huns. The Canadians, and especially the Canadian Army Medical Corps, and discovered this and have written about this in my, my new book, which will be out next year, uh, took to saving the lives of the, uh, of the French uh, civilians who were liberated here. They set up uh, medical units to care for them. This is a, an image of Canadian uh, surgeons operating on a Canadian soldier, but they were uh, engaging in the same care for the French who had suffered all manner of abuse uh, under the occupation, uh, including malnutrition and, uh, and other long-term illnesses, which were exacerbated now, of course, by the Spanish flu and the killer mutated virus that was um, killing um, many of these malnourished French civilians. And yet amid this suffering, there was joy. As one Canadian medical officer wrote of the final months of the war, uh, 
one and all were looked upon as heroes and deliverers from oppression. He, like other Canadians, talked about the joy in giving back the French and then the Belgians when, we, when the Canadians crossed over the border around the 5th and the 6th of November, uh, of giving back the, the, the French and the Belgians their freedom after more than four years of occupation. Now, the liberation continued throughout that last week uh, of October, and in fact, would continue until the end of the war. And there was a major parade and celebration in Diné on the 27th of October, 1918. It included, as you can see in this photograph, Sir Arthur Curry on the far left, um, uh, Sir David Watson uh, in the middle uh, center, and a very special young staff officer temporarily attached to the Canadians. He's the young fellow looking over his left shoulder. It is indeed the Prince of Wales, the future uh, King Edward VIII. And he was attached to the Canadian court during this time. And there are lovely accounts of this massive celebration of the French citizens who were cheering on the Prince and the Canadian Corps Commander Curry uh, uh, and the Canadians who had brought liberation. And to quantify uh, some of these um, liberations, I guess, from the 11th of October until the Canadians faced off again against the Germans in their last set piece battle at Valenciennes on the 1st of November, the Canadians freed at least 70,000 French civilians. 70,000 French civilians given back their freedom. Now, the liberation of the French and the Belgians was, I would argue, the capstone for many Canadians who had sacrificed so much and who also had taken part in um, returning freedom to the French and the Belgians who had suffered for so long under German oppression. Perhaps it's best to give the last word to a Canadian. Private William Davidson of the Canadian Field Artillery, Upon taking part in the great celebrations in Mons after victory and liberation there on November 11th, he wrote this. It made one feel that all this fighting had been worthwhile to see a people so glad to be delivered from hard rulers. Now, more could be said about this liberation period, and I have said it in a publication with uh, Legion magazine. It's uh, one of their um, hardbound uh, special publications, and, and you may be interested in ordering it. Uh, I think you can get it online with uh, Legion. But in my remaining time, I want to explore briefly how and why this liberation story has been forgotten. And I think you'd agree with me that we don't often think of the British or the Canadian commitment to the fighting on the Western Front as one of liberation. Indeed, after the hard-fought victory, the vast Canadian Expeditionary Force was demobilized rapidly in 1919. Again, Jack uh, Granitstein and I edited a book on this that came out uh, just last year uh, with UBC Press uh, on the, the year 1919, looking at the massive turmoil in Canada and the return of the citizen soldiers to their communities. And Canada moved forward into a new uncertain future. But why? Why was the liberation idea forgotten? And why is it not part of our social memory uh, today? I think we have to start, of course, with the following, with the 66,000 Canadian war dead. Their memory stalked the nation to mark this gutting wound individuals, communities, cities, provinces, and the national government observed, marked, and commemorated that terrible loss. There was Armistice Day with its two minutes of silence, the poppy adopted from John McRae's poem in Flanders Fields, and thousands of memorials erected in communities across this country. Wherever you are from, I hazard a guess, there is a memorial uh, from the First World War. In Ottawa, the Peace Tower and the National War Memorial were under construction to be unveiled in 1927 and 1939. Of course, overseas, there is the Brooding Soldier and Vimy and Beaumont Hamel and other uh, sites to mark Canadian loss. And that loss was felt very keenly across the country for decades. And it remains an important way that we often think about the war, uh, reinforced, I would argue, around this time of year with Remembrance Day soon to be upon us. 
Another major aspect, I would argue, about the memory of the war is how it changed Canada, how uh, we as a country emerged uh, different from the struggle and the sacrifice. We as Canadians had stood shoulder to shoulder with Britain and other allies, and we were transformed as a nation. And that is often summed up in the Vimy story, which took on greater importance with the erection of the memorial there, uh, and, and this idea of the war of Canada's coming of age. Historians with the gift of hindsight and study reflected on the war's important. And in the early 1960s, Donald Crichton, uh, one of Canada's great historians from that generation, was to write, in 1914, the, nat the nation resembled an overgrown, awkward adolescent who had not quite reached manhood. It was the war that completed the great transformation and demonstrated its reality for all to see. And there are other accounts from historians. I could pick many, but I'll give you one more from G.W.L. Nicholson, who wrote the seminal official history of the CF in 1962. And he wrote this, as the war progressed, the sense of national unity, which permeated the Canadian Corps, became stronger and stronger. They fought as Canadians and those who returned brought back with them a pride of nationhood that they had not known before. Now, we know that's an important story that emerged from the war, the idea of Canada stepping out onto the world stage, of being fundamentally changed, of developing its own heroes and symbols and a greater sense of identity. And it's not wrong. Um, it is certainly an aspect of the war, although viewed differently, of course, in French speaking Quebec, uh, where uh, despite tens of thousands serving, the idea of conscription imposed by the English majority was the most prominent aspect of the social memory of the war for decades to follow. And as I argued in my book on Vimy, and as others have argued, um, many politicians, intellectuals in Quebec chose to highlight conscription. Uh, instead of the French Canadians, who served by the tens of thousands, willingly and bravely in uniform during the war. And just as Vimy became a powerful symbol of unity and national development and martial pride, there was a different symbol in Quebec. Uh, and it was one of oppression and, and the highlighting of conscription over service. So again, another powerful uh, memory emerging out of the war. And I would argue that um, after the many decades of long heated debate about the war's meaning in Canada, as it was in every country, the idea of liberation simply was pushed aside. It was neither linked to the idea of the sacred fallen, nor the question of nationhood emerging in the symbol of Vimy, nor the war's darker legacy in Quebec. Those three dominant strands of memory were entangled and entwined, having contested meanings among different groups of Canadians, but they left little place for the concept of liberation. At the same time, the liberation idea was not marked with memorials. It was not an idea that led to intense debate about nation building or the nation rendering effects of the war. And it became even more foreign from the 1960s when a new generation of writers and historians and filmmakers condemned the Great War and the bunglers and butch, uh, butchers that they said oversaw it. There was no liberation idea to be found in sending the boys into the maw of the waiting guns. And maybe perhaps most importantly, as this image indicates, the idea of a war fought for freedom and liberation was much more prominent in 1945, as seen in this photograph of Canadians liberating the Dutch. If the Great War led to Canada's coming of age, the Second World War, I would argue, was the necessary war against Hitler and the fascists. Few at the time or ever since have questioned the utter need to defeat the fascists with their mad dreams of conquest and genocide. In the last year of the war, 1945, with the Canadians engaged in the crucial work of saving the Dutch from mass starvation was a more powerful symbol of liberation than that which drove Canadians during the Great War and especially in the liberation phase of late 1918. And yet, some of the things I've said, if you know the history of 1945, and if you know the stories of Canadian soldiers in 1945 talking about 
the interactions with the liberated Dutch, there are remarkable similarities, even though the liberation of 1918 has been almost entirely ignored. As the Canadian Great War veterans lost their war against time to join the many thousands of comrades who lay buried under the Commonwealth War Graves Commission headstones overseas, the idea of a just and necessary war to liberate the French and Belgians in 1918 faded with memory. The liberation idea was buried with those liberators. I'm gonna finish up here with a few final thoughts. I wanna make something clear. The actions of Canadians during the Great War were not solely driven by the idea of liberating Western Europe, no. More important was to stand by Britain or to serve Canada's emerging national interests. Although, as I have said, there was never simply one motivating factor. I would argue that the liberation idea mattered to Canadians at the time. And I would also argue it has been almost entirely ignored in the literature ever since. During that final liberation phase, journalist uh, J.F.B. Livesey, who was embedded overseas with the Canadian Corps, wrote of seeing a Canadian infantryman in the war's final days, taking delight in sharing his rations with stunted French children who had suffered severely almost all of their lives under the German occupation. The war was imprinted on their tiny bodies through malnourishment and unimaginable psychological trauma. And yet these children cheered and laughed with the Canadian soldier who was far, far away from his family. In that moment, the Canadian soldier turned to Livesey with tears in his eyes and said, for all we have gone through, our dead have not died in vain. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tim, for that excellent talk. Uh, I think it just adds another uh, dimension to the value uh, of the First World War's legacy, and especially to the Canadian sacrifice at that time. You know, as I mentioned, more Canadian war dead in the First World War than all of our other conflicts combined. So just to find another area where, you know, our, our contribution, our sacrifice meant so much to so many civilians and, and this level of liberation that is, as like you said, overshadowed, not only in the popular concept, but in the historiography as well. It's always on the Second World War and Holland and Germany. This really adds, uh, you know, an important new wrinkle to, uh, to our understanding of the First World War, which I always appreciate. So, so thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, look forward to the book. So, uh, without further ado, let's uh, jump right into our final question and answer period. Um, once again, uh, you can submit your questions into the chat box for either Tim or for Andy. Uh, two great presentations, both very different, but uh, I'm sure there's, there's much to talk about. So I'll get us started here um, for Andy. Yes. Uh, I'd like to ask about uh, the Canadian connection to the anglo Zulu War, given the... Um, the theme of our conference. Yes, well, this is something I forgot to uh, talk about, but um, one of the civil surgeons that served with the British Army was uh, a doctor by the name of Rolf Leslie, who was born in my hometown, Dundas. He was a graduate of the University of Toronto. He graduated in 1876. After graduation, he moved to England, where he hoped to establish himself as a, as a surgeon but he was recruited by the Turks as a senior medical officer in the Turkish army and so had experience during the Turco-Serbian War of 1877. The following year, he was appointed as surgeon major in the Turkish army and saw experience in the Turco-Russian War or the Russo-Turkish War. So before he even went to Zululand, to assist with the medical treatment and uh, be part of the medical services there. He had already had experience and he was already a highly decorated civil surgeon. So in addition to his uh, uh, awards that he was given for his services to the Turkish army, he was awarded the uh, South Africa Service Medal with, uh, with the bar 
And after the war in Africa, he took an interest in tropical diseases. And he devoted himself to helping people recover from tropical diseases. And he wrote a book titled Hints to Travelers in the Tropics. Such was his devotion. Unfortunately, he um, experienced an untimely death in 1893. Once again, um, working with patients, he succumbed to a tropical disease in the um, Caribbean, and that was the end of his story. But a nice connection to Dundas, Canada, uh, with regards to the Anglo Zulu War, 1879. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. And Dundas, coincidentally, is where you live as well. So how fitting that. Yes. Uh, and you have one of the best, uh, probably the best private collection of Anglo Zulu uh, artifacts in Canada. So it's just a uh, splendid, splendid connection. Uh, so, Tim, this next one's for you. Uh, this is from Petros Dorizis. He's uh, calling in from Greece. He asks, do we know how the French tell their experience of occupation and liberation in the First World War? Like many other occupied countries during World War II, France has its own particular interpretation and mythologizing narrative of occupation and liberation in World War II. But it seems for the First World War, neither the liberating allies nor the liberated French seem to view that conflict through the lens of occupation and liberation. Yeah, you're right. And um, uh, it's a complicated response to any question around national myths. And if we think of the Second World War and we think of the fall of France and we think of the occupation, we know that uh, both during the war and after the war for decades, there were strong national narratives to help assuage, I think, the guilt over occupation and that everyone was involved in the resistance, for instance. And we know from more recent scholarship, that simply wasn't the case with Vichy France and, and many millions of French collaborating with Nazi occupiers. The First World War is a little different and it's, uh, you're exactly right. What are the stories that we tell and what are the stories that we elevate and which are the ones that we silence? In Canada, for the First World War, we talk about Vimy. I mean, that's just undeniable. That's the story. Um, in Australia, it's interesting. They have a similar uh, idea, which is Gallipoli. And in both, there is this sort of birth of a nation, a trial by fire. Um, for the French in the First World War, it is, of course, um, Verdun becomes the titanic battle and the defense there, the heroic and grisly defense from February of 1916 to November of 1916 and turning back the Germans, or maybe it's the uh, Battle of Marne or perhaps even the victories at the end of the war. But the French um, uh, have contributed to this partially because they they um, do not like to see it as a war of liberation because they were fighting tooth and nail and suffered uh, severely during that time. That doesn't mean that it diminishes the Canadian story in any way. And I would suggest um, that the Belgians do see it uh, through a stronger lens of um, allied contributions to help free their country because a larger part of their country was occupied. Uh, all of it is interesting to think of, of what do countries um, say or think about their own history? How do they present it? And how does it change over time? And I think if my talk is a way to think about that, I would suggest that we have some established narratives about the Great War. Um, and yet, um, through scholarship and through a, a new appraisal, there's always an opportunity to inject more nuance or a different um, element of the story. And this is one. Again, I'm not here to overplay my hand. And yet, I think now, hopefully, after having listened to this, you'll have a greater sense that Canadians um, for some of them, they were simply motivated to free an oppressed people. Thanks for that, Tim. Uh, this next question is for Andy. Just have a few here before we uh, wrap it all up. For Andy, this is from Mike Clary. Um, Mike, of course, is a member of the museum committee. He's also a member of the board of directors and a former combat engineer. So, Andy. Yes. You mentioned the significance of the emerging understanding of microbes as a cause of disease. Did that development come out of the Anglo-Zulu War or was it just contemporary? Well, microscopes were um, designed and uh, developed in the 17th century. 
but the scientists or the so-called scientists or medical people they would look at the rods and cones and say well that's just nothing to nothing to be uh, taken seriously and it wasn't until about two or three years later after the Anglo-Zulu war that um, a Russian scientist figured out that the rods and cones were actually microbes or bacteria and that they were causing the diseases. But what basically the, um, the Anglo-Zulu war occurred just at the cusp of great advances. And those advances came into being very quickly, advances like radiology or radiography and um, the microscope, um, sterilization and the continuing progressive use of disinfectants that were first developed by Dr. Lister when he started using carbolic acid and also anesthetics. I mean, I could have gone on and talked about use of anesthetics as a subject on its own, but uh, uh, simply put, the Anglo-Zulu War occurred just before those major medical advances. Excellent. Thank you for that question, Mike, and for your response, Andy. Um, your wealth of knowledge, my friend. So we Thank have you. just a couple more questions. Uh, one standalone question for Tim, and then a uh, two-part question, one for Tim, one for Andy, before we come up here. So Tim, this one's for you. This is from Bruce Stock. Bruce asks, Farsight question. In the decades ahead, will our military heritage and national heritage ever combine to become one indestructible pillar of Canadian confidence? Yeah, thanks, Bruce. Um, I, I think what you're getting at there is that we have historically in Canada downplayed our uh, military history and that um, for many decades, we saw ourselves as a nation of peacekeepers or uh, a nation that brought peace to the world. And I'm very proud of what we did on our diplomatic fronts or with our soldiers. But of course, it is a fairly narrow view to think of even during the Cold War that Canadian forces were only involved in peacekeeping. They weren't. The majority of time was involved in NATO operations or NORAD or fighting around the world in other theaters. And, and peacekeeping was a fairly minor uh, part of that. Um, and if one is to think of the 20th century alone, we fought in the South African War and the First World War and the Second World War and the Korean War and aspects of the Cold War and Gulf War in 1990 and the Kosovo bombing campaign and Afghanistan, of course, in the 21st century and further back, um, more warfare. War has shaped our country. And I think um, we ignore it at our own peril, uh, a peril at understanding who we are as Canadians. And I have written about this in books like Vimy or my more recent one, The Fight for History, where I, I just uh, I wanted to try to come to grips with why we as Canadians had done such a poor job in talking about our incredible and I would argue epic contributions during the Second World War. And yet for decades and decades, we ignored that history or even more perversely, we twisted it into a series of defeats and disgraces. I would argue we have done a better job over the last 20 or 25 years, but there's still work to go forward. And as the book of that, uh, the title of that book suggests, the fight for history is always a fight. It's a fight against, um, between contested narratives, maybe more importantly, it's a fight against apathy. And I think um, these stories need to be told. I thank Ryan for organizing this and the RCMI because here's an opportunity for us to, uh, to learn and to listen and to come away with a better understanding of our shared history. And I think what you've heard today is not heroic history, you know, stand behind the flag history. We've talked about some of the grim aspects of war. Um, and yet uh, it is important to tell these stories in, in fullness and richness, because I believe, as I think many here probably believe, that our history is a foundation from which to go forward. Uh, and, and I think perhaps um, uh, that's one way to respond to your question. Thanks very much. Well said, Tim, thank you for that. And obviously your many books and work have gone far away to helping to remedy this uh, you know, current climate. And uh, thank you for that. Uh, last two-part question. Uh, 
both of these questions come from Mike Brassard. So this first part will be for Andy, and then I'll ask the second part to, to Tim uh, once you've given your part. Andy, yes. can you detail some of the natural remedies that the British surgeons used in the Anglo-Zulu War? Well, I could say they adopted a number of the practices used by the Zulu natives, because as I said, wounded Zulus were treated and welcomed into the hospitals as part of the beginning of the process of extending goodwill. So they treated them fairly well. And as the Zulus didn't want to really be treated by using British medical techniques and the use of British medicine, they brought in their own herbs. And while I have everything listed, um, it's been about 12 years since I looked at that list, but I can provide it to Mike. However, I can say that Fleet Surgeon Norbury, Norbury uh, would hunt around and gather various bark samples from the trees and discovered that a number of them um, had astringent or coagulating properties. And he developed uh, concoctions or medicines to help stop with the bleeding. And this was very successful when he wrote about that. The exact um, name of the trees I can't tell you off the top of my head, but I can provide Mike with any information I do have. Thank you, Andy, for that. Um, Tim, this last one's for you. Also for Mike here. Uh, this question appears to be about uh, the colorization uh, process of um, First World War black and white images. He asks, colorization seems to interpret the original image Colors not necessarily precise to the original subjects. Why not leave the imagery as is? Yeah, thanks for that. Um, I would argue that um, the colorization adds a new richness of understanding for contemporary audiences. A uh, hundred years later, with no one left from the war, uh, I think it is far too easy for generations, uh, especially in Canada, untouched directly by war, to, um, to look back at those Canadians in uniform and to think that they are almost cardboard characters, black and white figures. Uh, they are not like us. And yet we know they are like us. They, they lived, they felt dawn. Um, they had hopes and dreams, uh, they died in agony, they came home with the war imprinted on them. The colorization, I would argue, helps people to make that connection. In the context of our exhibition, we talked about the value and perhaps the challenges of doing that. Uh, we made it very clear uh, through signs and plaques that we had engaged in a colorization process. Uh, and we actually explained why we did that. We had visitor surveys, moreover, that asked visitors periodically, what did you like about this exhibition? The colorization was the top one or two in almost every single aspect of those surveys. And I suppose in one final example, I would draw uh, your attention to Peter Jackson's stunning film, which in talking to colleagues at the Imperial War Museum about a week ago, um, and they partnered with Peter Jackson and he colorized film uh, for that production. They said it has been seen by over 300 million people. That is a staggering number, um, a shocking number. And it is in a powerful way, I think, for people now in the 21st century to still have a connection, a meaningful connection to these Canadians. And I would suggest that that is an important part of what we are doing and what we are trying to do. Well said, thank you for that, Tim. And um, I'd also like to vouch for Peter Jackson's uh, work as well, We Shall Not Grow Old. It's an amazing documentary and I particularly enjoyed how the entire documentary was narrated by the real voices of veterans, not just those reading the letters, but the actual voices that were recorded in the mid 20th century by the Imperial War Museum among others. So. If you haven't already seen uh, We Shall Not Grow, highly recommend. So thank you for that. And let me just uh, wrap it up here as we've come to the end of our uh, second question and answer period.
Uh, so before I conclude and just briefly announce what's next for our museum, I'd like to say a few thank yous. Uh, first to our speakers, Tyler, Andy, and Tim. Your collective expertise and a diverse and well-delivered series of topics has served our audience and our conference incredibly well. We've heard today on the Spanish Civil War, material history of the First World War, the medicine of the Anglo-Zulu War, and the liberation of the First World War. I can confidently speak for our audience when I say it's been a great seminar. We appreciate the diversity and the expertise of our speakers, and we look forward to doing something similar again next year. I just also want to say a special thank you to Sylvia Lau for her assistance throughout this entire project of bringing it together all the technical aspects. And of course, to the Museum Committee of the RCMI, led by the Chair Bill Hines, for your continued and unwavering support. My last thank, excuse me, my last thank you, of course, goes out to our viewers for tuning in and for participating in a three-hour session on a Saturday on military history. And I think that overall speaks to, you know, the strength of the topic and the general interest that uh, continues to. Um, persist. And I thank you for that and joining in and for the great questions. And it, it really gives me a lot of confidence, uh, you know, in the future of all of this, you know, it's because of viewers and patrons such as yourselves that we can continue to host these events and to present and discuss our history as Tim said at such an elite level. Fittingly during Remembrance Week, you know, we honor and we commemorate our rich military past and the individuals who served and of course, who have died for Canada. That's ultimately what it's all about. I like to say it's, uh, it's for the men. So thank you again to our speakers and for joining us today for today's symposium, Canadian Military History at Large. The proceedings will be uploaded to RCMI YouTube this week. You can next look forward to the unveiling of our permanent First World War exhibition at the RCMI later this month. We plan to stream this virtually as well. Until then, be well, and thanks for listening. This has been another in our series of webcasts produced by the Royal Canadian Military Institute in Toronto as a public educational service. You can find news of upcoming events and links to our webcast archives at www.rcmi.org. On behalf of the RCMI, this is Eric Morse saying goodbye for now, and thank you for joining us.